Inscription is a game that exists in a very specific and rare media niche that I find fascinating. When someone recommends Inscription to you, it often boils down to just a couple of points. The game is extremely good, but learning anything about it will spoil the reasons why. This form of recommendation perplexes me. It is at once an empathic endorsement of the product, and a complete refusal to explain the reasoning behind it. Like the reviewer's equivalent of saying, Oh dude, it was so funny, but y you know, you just had to be there. Well, fine. If you need me to be there, then I'll go there. Okay, time to figure out what's on this thing. The Challenger. It's been ages. Perhaps you've forgotten how this game is played. Allow me to remind you. With this simple introduction, we're launched right into the tutorial. For the most part, players who have an existing familiarity with card games like Magic and Yu-Gi-Oh! will feel at home. Most creatures require sacrifices, but you can always choose to draw a free squirrel at the start of your turn in order to feel your larger cards. Creatures have health and damage values typical of a game in the genre, and damage is maintained between turns similar to games like Hearthstone. At the end of the turn, each creature will attack the one immediately in front of it, and any damage that hits an empty lane will be dealt to the player. Inscription's health system is probably its most interesting and unique gameplay feature. Rather than having players begin with predefined life totals, life is represented as weight being put on a scale. If either player's weight tips the scale all the way over, they lose. This creates an incredibly interesting literal push and pull to the flow of the game, as you calculate whether you'll be able to deal enough damage to the enemy to offset the large creature that you can't afford to block. Dealing damage to the enemy is also equivalent to healing yourself for the same value, shifting the dynamics of creature combat pretty significantly, as small and evasive creatures can allow you to tank relatively large hits to avoid your demise. After the tutorial, the next time you draw the stoat card, it starts... talking to you? Apparently, he was asleep before when you sacrificed him, and he's not too happy about it. The Game Master assured you that the creature's pain was real, and I guess he wasn't kidding. This stoat guy's kind of an asshole, but it seems like he has a plan, so you play along for now. From here, you get into a gameplay loop reminiscent of popular deck-building roguelike Slay the Spire, where combat is interspersed with various story events that allow you to alter and improve your deck, such as a shrine that allows you to sacrifice a creature to bestow its abilities onto another creature. These events are themed as your captor running the game like a dungeon master, taking on different personas and describing various scenarios. As a roguelike deck building game, it's solid. Solid enough that I'd play it if they did something crazy like patch in an alternate game mode that I'd spend another 30 hours grinding for lore paragraphs. As an avid card game enthusiast, I found a lot of strategic depth in the way that positioning your creatures in the lane matters, and the interactions between various different abilities enabling some wacky combos. The boss fights at the end of each floor do a great job of testing your skills in unorthodox ways, asking you to think about things like play order and card positioning much more carefully to avoid disaster, and helping you learn the ways you can exploit card mechanics to bypass certain hazards. It also must be said that the vibes in this game are fucking incredible. The game is dark, but oddly calm, with atmospheric, finger-style guitar melodies creating a haunting but naturalistic feeling like the last song being played around the dying embers of a campfire after everyone else has gone to bed. Every song on the soundtrack creates this wonderful and intense mood without becoming so distracting that it makes it hard to strategize. Let's take a moment to appreciate it.
sooner or later, you'll slip up and lose. And this is where Inscription begins to show a little more of its hand. The Game Master asks you to get up, and this leads to a segment where you walk around the cabin like a point-and-click adventure game, which I completely didn't expect. What? What is this? I Spy Spooky Mansion? What the hell? For now, you just need to retrieve the candles that represent your lives, but there are various objects in the room that are very clearly puzzle-like in origin. Like, come on, a game developer won't put a safe with a combination in a room unless eventually you're going to open it. And when you do that, you meet a second talking card, the stink bug, and she seems to know the stoat. But you're not any closer to learning how to escape. Eventually, you'll die for real, and this leads to the introduction of another of Inscription's clever and interesting mechanics. When you die, you have to restart, of course, but you have an opportunity to create a death card, a custom card created by taking aspects from cards that were in your deck in the previous run. With the right cards and just a little bit of luck, you can make some pretty broken shit, like a zero-cost creature with the stats of a three-tribute creature and a the abilities of the strongest creatures in the game. Death cards will give you a sense of inevitability as you slowly build a pool of increasingly busted cards that can show up on your future runs and help you feel like your time wasn't entirely wasted on a run that meets its unfortunate end. And now at this point of the video, I'm going to start getting into content that I would have preferred not to know about before playing Inscription myself. So now it's my turn to do the thing. Inscription is a very special game, and what I've shown you so far is only a small part of the larger whole. If the game was only this part, I would still recommend it, but there's much more I still want to share. If you haven't played Inscription yet, I would highly encourage you to close this video right now and come back once you've learned the truth of what the game has to offer. This will be your only warning. As you progress through Inscription's various challenges, you'll meet the final member of the Talking Card crew, the Stunted Wolf, who gives you a roll of film that you quickly hide away before your captor is able to notice. At this point, all you need to do is beat the final encounter to unlock the first layer of Inscription's secrets. The final encounter is a grueling, three-stage gauntlet, featuring several of the strongest cards in the game, alongside your own custom death cards, and a final showdown with the moon itself. And finally, you beat the boss. Oh my, did I just... I think I just beat him! Oh. Hey there, card gamers! I'm the Lucky Carter, and this is a vintage pack opening video. Today I'm opening a few super rare old packs I snagged at a garage sale. I've got four packs of Inscription. You would not believe the deal I got on these. Now, not all of you will even remember this game. I'm barely old enough to have uh, seen these going around in my childhood. Uh, for whatever reason, they only did one set of these cards, and then stopped printing them. Whew. There we go. Yeah. Okay. And now, we dig. I give a 75% chance it's a rock. But, only one way to find out. What? This is the real story of Inscription. And if you'd been paying very close attention, you might have been able to figure it out ahead of time. When you boot the game for the first time, you hear a disembodied voice that you can now in retrospect identify as Luke Carter from the Lucky Carter YouTube channel. You, you know, the guy in the footage. He's just found what he understands to be a piece of lost media, a floppy disk containing an unreleased build of a video game based on the short-lived inscription card game published by Game Funa in the late 2010s. And we've been playing as Luke Carter the entire time. So we, the player, are playing the real-world game Inscription, inhabiting the body of a fictional Luke Carter 
who is also playing that exact same real-world inscription, which is based on a fictional, in-universe card game named inscription that's not actually real. Just writing that sentence was hard, let alone understanding it, but that's beside the point. Luke's story, our story, isn't over yet. It's only just started. Like a brand new game. In the beginning, the world did not know cards. That is, until the day the scribes arrived. Each had their own method of inscription to create cards. Primora used her quill to inscribe the epitaphs of the dead. Leshy used his wildlife camera to capture beasts. P03 used a particle scanner to copy the CPUs of robots and Magnificus used his brush to paint his wizard pupils. With the cards created, the scribes had solidified their power. Until one day, a challenger arrived to replace one of the scribes. That's me! Uh, well, Luke, I guess, you know. Welcome back to Inscription. It's still the same game, but it's not quite the same game. This version of Inscription feels a lot older and the gameplay loop seems to be inspired by games like Chandelar, that one MTG DOS game, or the one Pokemon TCG game they released on the Game Boy Color. There's an overworld with sub-areas, and you have an ever-expanding collection of cards to challenge the various trials with. Along the way, you'll learn a little more about each of the scribes, and their relationship to both the player and inscription itself. The blood mechanic from the first act is unchanged, alongside the bone mechanic I decided not to elaborate on because it would slow the pace of the video and I'm trying not to be here for an hour. In the early parts of this act of the game, these are the only mechanics you'll have easy access to, but two new playstyles will eventually reveal themselves in the form of technological and magical cards. Technological cards have an energy cost instead of requiring resources. At the start of the player's turn, they gain plus one maximum energy and all of their energy refills capping out at a maximum of six energy to spend as you wish. The observant among you will already know what game this reminds me of. Magical cards require you to run a certain color of Mox card before playing the majority of them, and each color has its own sort of identity, which is really neat. Someone could design a whole game out of the idea of colors representing identities, and it's a real shame no one's thought of that before. The player is welcome to mix and match these playstyles in the deck building screen, as long as the player's deck has at least 20 cards in it. That means you could play an undead wizardry deck that wants to use the mox cards to generate extra bones in order to play larger threats, or a beastly technology deck that wants to play big cards quickly by using cheap robots as parts for bigger beastly threats. The four styles feel distinct, but they're not mechanically exclusive enough that they have a hard time working with each other unless you're trying to make something really janky. As you explore the world of Inscription, you'll meet some familiar faces. Hey, it's the Angler again! He killed my ass when I went too far in his first run. Ugh, I remember that. Good times. And there's the Prospector again. That's fun. Hey, the layout of this cabin feels kind of familiar, huh? A anyway, after defeating the man who we now know is Leshy for a second time, we learned that P03 and the Stoat from Act 1 are one and the same, and that Leshy trapped him in the card somehow. But wait a minute, I thought this was a totally different game. Well, kind of. Remember how I was describing all these different playstyles for these different deck archetypes just a minute ago? Each of those archetypes are inscription, just as much as this version is. They just represent that specific scribe's ideal inscription, or the one, at least, that's most closely tied to their flavor. What we were playing in Act 1 was the version of inscription that exists when Leshy is the dominant scribe in control of the game. However that works. As you further explore the world of Inscription and expand your card collection, you'll get a sense for each scribe's personality. Leshy's game is raw and untamed, with beasts battling for control of the food chain. P03's game is efficient, with care taken to ensure that your deck is able to run consistently and maintain an appropriate power level. Magnificus's game is expressive, with the color triangle allowing for each player to mix and match their own custom idea of what an Inscription deck should be. Grimora is also here. Honestly, she's a bit of an anomaly when it comes to the story as a whole, and I have a hard time fitting her into my understanding of Inscription's meta-narrative. The highlights of this act are the boss fights with each of the four scribes, especially Leshy and P03. Grimora's fight is so simplistic that on my first run through the game, I honestly forgot she had mechanics at all, and Magnificus's fight is very fun and has great music, 
but it's easy to exploit and build decks around. Leshy's Fight is kind of a fun inversion of the skill tests you saw in Act 1, with the emphasis on played card order from Act 1 flipped to become card death order in Act 2. In order to maximize your chances of defeating Leshy, you'll have to use your cards tactically, and choose which cards you want to put together into your death card for the start of Phase 2. P03's fight uses this rotating board, forcing you to think very carefully about how you position your cards, lest they drift over to the enemy board. Building decks to take on these kinds of challenges requires thought as you determine how these mechanics affect your own playstyle, and how to best leverage the mechanics to your advantage. After the final scribe is felled, there's one last choice to make. Who do you replace? Regardless of who you choose, the fight that follows this decision is the same, which is a bit unfortunate, but understandable in retrospect. You always fight P03 at the end of Act 2, and he always plays a mysterious glitchy card that a previous mini-boss fished out of the waters that lie deep below the world of Inscription. And if you damage that card or kill P03, something goes very, very wrong. I bet you thought I was pulling a little mat pat in that last segment, huh? Doing a little, oh, it's just a theory. No, that wasn't conjecture. It was just a literal plot summary. In this act, P03 runs inscription now. The way P03 runs inscription is a little different. He doesn't seem too interested in silly things like storytelling or world building or creating a mood. He's just here to play the game. This is Botopia, and it's ruled over by four... Uh, uberbots, I guess. And you want to beat them to perform the Great Transcendence, which we're certain is a good thing because P03 told us it is. Welcome back to Inscription. It's still the same game, but it's not quite the same game. Blood and Bones are completely gone now, replaced by P03's own energy system and his own suite of cards, and a brand new fifth lane to play cards in. At this point, neither we nor Luke are unfamiliar with the way Inscription works, so it's all pretty familiar for the most part. It's sort of a hybrid between Leshy's Inscription and Inscription Prime, with the second act's open world map mixed with the incremental upgrades and deck edits of the first act's roguelike paradigm. The world map mirrors that of Inscription Prime, with each uberbot in their respective area being broadly themed around the scribe that was introduced in that quadrant of the map in Act 2. If you try to get up off the table like you did in Act 1, you'll discover that P03 isn't as interested in letting you have a say in things. He wants to achieve the Great Transcendence, and you're a piece of that plan, not a willing participant in his game. He only lets you get up and wander around the area when it becomes absolutely necessary as systems begin to break down. Hey, the layout of this factory seems... kind of familiar, huh? And these talking cards do, too. I didn't talk about the Lonely Wizard back when we met him in Act 2, but he's a lovely, funny little guy. He's not that important to the things I'm talking about, though. The same applies to our friend Gubert, who reappears here in Act 3 to tell us that the other scribes are still alive and planning a way to stop P03's machinations. Heh. <laughs> machinations. Get it? Because he's a machine? Ah, but I digress. The ways in which you're allowed to manipulate your cards in Act 3 are quite extensive, such as the ability to add sigils to cards without any downsides, or giving the card a second form that it switches to every other turn. Later on in the Act, you're even allowed to create completely custom cards from scratch, rather than combining aspects of existing cards in your deck or whatever. After each uberbot, you also get to add a sigil to your empty vessels, which take the role that squirrels had in Act 1, making them into genuinely useful tools for your deck's arsenal, rather than a last resort. The bosses in Act 3 are easily the best in the entire game, with the most creative and interesting gimmicks. From using actual files on your real computer as game pieces, risking deleting them as a result of game mechanics, to creating gimmicks in real time as the boss fight goes on. Act 3's bosses show immense creativity, and do a great job of playing around with the fact that not only are you playing a card game, you are playing a digital, internet-capable card game, and it creates these one-of-a-kind mechanics and moments that can't work in any other medium. 
most people will cite Act 1 as their favorite act of inscription, and if you had me at gunpoint, I'd probably agree, but the highlights of Act 3 are so high that it would certainly give me a moment of pause when I evaluate the question in my head. After you progress to the point where you're ready to take on the final fight of Act 3, you're suddenly whisked away into a dark room where the other three scribes are waiting for you. They're still alive, and they're plotting a way to take control back from P03 before he performs the Great Transcendence, which, surprise, isn't actually a good thing. For now, all you have to do is play along. When you reach the final fight, p 03 reveals the true nature of his game, and the Great Transcendence. When you were fighting those bosses, you gave Inscription access to your hard drive, and you took screenshots, and you connected the game to the internet. All of the things you'd need to put the game on Steam, and release Inscription, and whatever lies deep below, into the world. So we, the player, and Luke Carter alongside us, are playing the released version of Inscription, which is a version of the fictional in-world adaptation of Inscription, the card game that only exists in the context of this fictional story. And by doing so, we've confirmed that the Great Transcendence has already happened, because the game can't have been available for purchase otherwise. But we're about to stop the Great Transcendence. Look, Leshy just ripped P03's head off. Hey, wait, what's Grimora doing with our file system? Oh, no. I haven't been entirely honest with you. Luke Carter's story isn't actually the real story of Inscription. The story of the scribes I told you in Act 2 isn't the real story of Inscription either. None of this is the real story of Inscription. Inscription is a story about games, and game development, and the people who put their hearts and souls into it. The details of the story are somewhat incomplete, with the pieces scattered through not only Inscription, but other Daniel Mullins games, and even some games that aren't telling you they're Daniel Mullins games, so please bear with me if my interpretation doesn't quite line up with yours. There's something sinister lurking deep below Inscription, in the endless waters of what is referred only as the Old Data. The exact nature of what is contained within the Old Data is unknown, but it's clearly supernatural in origin, something that's either been created by the Devil, or perhaps is the Devil himself. The keen-eyed among you will see that the Old Data has been here all along, pulling the strings behind the scenes. It existed long before Inscription did, and will exist long after all of us cease to be. The team that developed the digital adaptation of Inscription were, knowing or unknowing, building their game on the back of the old data, like a team of architects accidentally defacing an ancient burial site. The game they would develop took the form of the Inscription we see in Act 2, with Steam achievements referring to that version as, quote, the original Inscription. In my reading, the man who would become Leshy is the creator of the game, with his raw creative energy manifesting in the form of wild beasts, gnashing teeth and claw instinctually, without care or motive, simply to survive. He loves the game, taking the time to establish a cohesive tone and build an immersive world. P03 is the primary programmer, with his logically inclined mind creating a sense of superiority and a desire to show dominance reflecting in both his playstyle and the design concepts he introduces in Act 3. His dialogue talks very explicitly about his experience creating the underlying systems that run Inscription, his feelings that he's not very appreciated for the work that he puts in, and his opinions on the other developers' mindsets. It makes sense now that the stoat was kind of an asshole. Magnificus is the game's artist, indicated of course by his brush and his ability to inscribe sigils onto your cards. His concern is as much with the elegance and craft of a card game as it is with the gameplay and his game focuses on allowing the player to use their deck as a canvas through which they can express themselves. Grimora, once again, eludes me, and I'm not sure where she fits into all this. Her position as the one who wishes to delete Inscription and get back to a world without all the scribes and their struggles with one another leads me to believe that she was either an innocent outsider or simply exhausted by the development process and burning out rapidly. Maybe she was one of the few who knew of the old Data's presence and wanted to do what she could to save the people she called her friends. In this final act, we finally get to meet these people. The actual people. Not Grimora, Leshy, Magnificus, but the people they used to be. And it's just... 
I can't describe it. It's the most incredible piece of storytelling I've ever seen in a video game. As the world literally deletes itself around you, bringing an end to what must have been decades of pain and struggle and repeated death after death after death, you get to sit down with your captors one last time. Not as adversaries or opponents, but simply as people, as gamers. And when their time finally reaches its end, you honor them with a handshake. It's a simple, poignant act, but one that I found deeply moving. Giving your opponent a handshake at the end of a game is something you do out of obligation or just because you feel like you need to, but this feels different. It's a sort of acknowledgement of these people as people rather than simply opponents in board states. It's an honorable act put into harsh context as you honor a long dead gamer's dying wish before their soul gets deleted forever. The final battle with Leshy hits this note especially so. You've been through so much since the end of Act 1, and Leshy's involvement has been pretty minimal since then. This person you met so long ago, who you assumed to be a raving madman, who trapped you in a cabin to play some kind of sinister shadow game, has revealed himself to be someone who's genuinely in love with the game that he plays. Even after the scales of life get deleted from the game, Leshy wants to continue. He doesn't care about the score or whatever. He just loves what he's created and he wants to play it as long as possible, even in the very moments before he's just gone. He reminds me of some of my friends, the people who brainstorm crazy variants of magic to fool around with on Commander Night or put together a cube with their friends. Someone who has the kind of unceasing passion for games that makes them do something as stupid as making one themselves. This person who for so long served as the primary obstacle blocking your path to victory takes on this new life as a kind, pitiable man who just wanted to do what he loved. And that makes the final handshake all the more sad before he simply just ceases to be. It's just, I don't know. It's something that only really hits you that hard if you really love games. Easily the single best moment of the entire game. If you got this far in and you haven't played the game yet, I'm, I'm so sorry. Soon enough, you've had your final goodbyes with each of the scribes, and almost nothing is left. The Trapper, the only character that seems to know the old data, is all that remains, and even she doesn't have long. With nothing left to do, we and Luke open the old data and see what's inside. What happens next isn't important. Like I said, that's not the real story. The real story is your story, the player's story. All the different strategic decisions you made along the way. The decks you built that mirror your own ideals and playstyles. The friends you met along the way, their souls now deleted, lost forever. The extremely long video you took several months to brainstorm after completing the game. And the people who come to your tiny little YouTube channel to watch it. Inscription is a fantastic game. And knowing anything about it will spoil the reasons why. It manages to not just be a good card game, but three different good card games. It tells multiple interwoven stories, both obvious and very, very hidden. It's a game that would take you less than four hours to beat, that I've logged 55 hours and 240 gigabytes of footage I'm gonna be very happy to delete into. It gave me a sense of awe that's extremely hard to capture in the post-internet age, not just once, but multiple times over the course of its runtime. If I hadn't played Ultra Kill this year, it'd be my favorite game I've played so far in 2024. If you've somehow gotten this far into the video and spoiled yourself on most of the good parts without playing Inscription for yourself, first of all, sorry, and second, you should go buy the game anyway. It's an incredible example of the ways games are uniquely capable of telling stories, as well as just being a genuinely fun and enjoyable card game with really high replayability. I've spoiled a lot of great story moments, but don't trick yourself into believing I've told you everything. Daniel Mullins will be maintaining a very high spot on my personal list of developers to watch for in the foreseeable future, and I'm waiting excitedly to discover what we'll find in the upcoming Pony Island 2 whenever that comes out. This video is easily the most difficult one I've ever had to make. I'm used to writing purely informative content, so this kind of dramatic and emotional writing is new territory for me. 
Upon finishing inscription, I just had so many thoughts buzzing around in my head, and I had to make multiple drafts and outlines and things just to get my ideas in order well enough to form an actual coherent script that wasn't just telling you things that happened. If you enjoyed the final product, please let me know by whatever means are most convenient for you. Comment, like, subscribe, that sort of thing. These sorts of videos take a ton of effort from start to finish, and any sort of feedback helps reassure me that it wasn't all in vain. I don't know what my next video topic is going to be, or even how long it's going to take to come out, but I hope I can see you there when it takes form. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed your time.